So, Dr. Dr. Shea, you have to, you talked about the use of validity techniques in suicide assessment, yeah. which is which is really very important. Yeah. And in your book, you describe a wide variety, uh, like a whole menu of options of many different uh, validity techniques. Uh, in what way, like, can you give us some examples of how validity techniques could be used in in eliciting other kinds of sensitive information? Uh, Absolutely. Uh, and as I said before, the validity techniques were not, for the most part, developed for suicide per se. They were developed by different researchers and clinicians uh, to uncover anything that's taboo or sensitive. So I'll share a different technique with you. This one is called uh, symptom amplification. Symptom and you amplification. use this, we would use this technique in our practices in only one instance. It's when you and I think that this particular patient is about to minimize something. In other words, we're asking them about their drinking behaviors or their drugging behaviors, so we think they're going to minimize. Uh, it is used in suicide uh, because often people minimize their suicidal intent. Uh, and I'm going to demonstrate how you can use it in, in, in different ways in just a minute. In suicide, by the way, we might turn to the patient after we've heard all the different ways they've been thinking of killing themselves, yeah. and you found the method of choice. You might then turn to them and say, you know, Ben, on your very worst days, you know, how much time do you spend thinking about killing yourself? You know, geez, 70% of your waking hours, 80% of your waking hours, 90%. And the way the symptom amplification works is I'm only using it with someone who I think is going to minimize. I don't just ask them how long they've done. By the way, it always has to deal with a quantity. It's used when you're trying to get at a quantity. Okay. Uh, I don't ask them how much time they're spending in a day thinking about killing themselves because I think they're going to minimize I give them a very high number right. so that they can use their defense mechanism of minimization, pull it down and say, oh, man, not 90% of my waking hour. I, geez, I'll tell you, though, 50% uh, of the day I'm thinking about it. And you see the right. fact that you've pulled it down yeah, has yeah. allowed you to find out there's still a problem. So you can see with drinking. Now, back to your point, where do we use these validity techniques uh, outside of suicide? Drinking is a perfect example. Uh, a person is using uh, – uh, they're a heavy drinker. They're homeless. Uh, you're in San Francisco. Um, you're bringing this guy into the house. Uh, you want to figure out if you need to cover him for DTs and how much you might want to be covering them, et cetera, et cetera. So you want to get the best possible idea of how much they've been drinking, which is hard to do, uh, obviously, uh, with a heavy drinker. But you could turn and say, geez, Jim, I'm just, and he tells you that whiskey is what he likes to drink. So I know he drinks whiskey. You could turn to him and say, uh, you know, how much do you drink in a typical day? That's just inviting minimization. Uh, instead, you might turn to him and say, you know, uh, roughly, Jim, how much do you drink in a typical day? You know, a pint, a fifth, a gallon? And then he goes, oh, man, not a gallon, man. Uh, not a, maybe a fifth. Certainly, I pint every day. So he is minimized down, but right. where they land still yeah. tells you there's a significant problem. Really awesome technique with perpetrators of domestic violence. You are interviewing a person, and maybe uh, you're really quite surprised. Uh, they came to you uh, voluntarily because of depression. Maybe they have PTSD. Yeah. And to your surprise, deep into the interview, they share with you that they've hit their wife. So at this point in time, obviously, they've opened the door. We've got to figure out what's the extent of the violence that this particular person is doing. Yeah. I could turn to them and say, uh, Jim, uh, and I'm just going to use uh, a guy as an example, obviously, uh, women, men. Anybody can be a perpetrator of domestic violence, per se, uh, or a victim. Uh, but I'm just going to use a male in this example. Um, so, Jim, uh, how many times do you think you've ever uh, hit your wife, you know, Mary? Uh, and one person could just simply say that. And I don't think you're going to get very good data. A typical perpetrator will say, ah, not that often, two, three times. Okay. Take the exact same patient, same moment in time, equally good clinicians. Both clinicians actually engage the patient really well. But the second clinician has learned about how to use symptom amplification. And they know when to use it. If you think someone's going to minimize, he goes, you know what? I'm going to use symptom amplification, just like the surgeon, a seven blade. Yeah. Turns to uh, Jim and says, you know, Jim, roughly how many times do you think you've ever uh, hit your wife? Uh, 30 times, 60 times, 80 times? He goes, oh, man, eight times. No way, man. Uh, I don't know, 10, 15 times. That is a five-fold improvement in the validity that that second interviewer got because right. of the use of a particular technique, a right. symptom amplification. Now, watch this. All of us as psychiatrists are interested in uh, whether our, our patients feel comfortable with their medications. 
And of course, research has shown that they are often not following through, uh, you know, the term medication. What's the patient's medication practice? Are they actually using it the way it's been prescribed? Have they cut the dose in half? Are they, you know, missing doses uh, intermittently, et cetera? So that's obviously a concern for us. So how do we get a better read on whether people are actually taking uh, their medications in the way we're prescribed? By the way, the research has shown that even clinicians who have good relationships with patients often do not get the truth about this in general. Sometimes they the, have the biggest problem because the patient doesn't want to disappoint them because they really yeah. like them. Yeah. So here's, we can use two validity techniques that we've just been talking about already. I could turn to the person and say, maybe I'm following them for uh, OCD or depression and it's been a month since I last saw them. I could just simply say, have you been taking the medications the way you know, I've been recommending? <clears throat> That's just inviting untruth in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. Uh, or I could turn to them, and let's say they're taking a uh, medication that they take, let's say BID, okay? I might turn to them and I'd say, you know, Mary, uh, some of my patients tell me that it can be really easy to forget their medications, especially if you have to take them twice a day, you know, once in the morning and once at night. I'm just curious, since the last time we met, roughly how many times do you think you might have missed a dose? Um, this is really a nice. Notice right. that what it was, was first of all, it was a normalization. normalization. I said, some of my patients have told me. Yeah. Then secondly, it was a gentle assumption because I didn't say, have you missed any doses? I said, how many times Time do you think you missed a dose? Right. If you wanted to add a symptom amplification because you were really suspicious this person was not taking the medicines very uh, frequently, you might add a, 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 a symptom amplification and say, you know, 10 of the days, 12 of the days, 15 of the days, put a high number since the last. Uh, anyway, right. So the, fact, so, so, so symptom the, amplification, the best way to do that one is you'd start with something like, you know, are you missing it every, you know, every 10, you know, 10, 10 times maybe? 20 times or maybe almost every day you miss a dose. You always go high and go even higher with a symptom amplification. Right. So, so you just beautifully demonstrated that if these techniques are not necessarily used in uh, isolation, but they can be combined together. To into doublets to, and triplets. In, into, uh, depending on the need. So these are the yeah, tools. That's the technical this, name, a doublet or a triplet. Doublet or a triplet. So you have these two, all these tools by your side and you can pick up the right tools and use yep. them in, in sequence depending on, you know, on the particular And, and each uh, viewer or reader of the book in, in that instance, it, once again, there's no right way to do it. What the book does is it just provides an expert or an experienced clinician as well as a trainee multiple ways. Yeah. Then you decide which ones you want and also you decide which ones are best for the fit for a client. The other thing that we're convinced happens, and this might happen even more with experienced clinicians than uh, trainees, is... They get really into the idea of understanding that they are using techniques, sometimes even without intentionally. Doing. They then look at their own interviews and they say, here's something I do over the years, the past 10 years, 20 years, and it's really effective. I'm going to call it, you know, blah, blah, blah. But then they, they now ask themselves, they now have the tool more intentionally in their mind. Yeah. They say, you know, I wonder why I don't always use that. Or I wonder if there's a certain type of patient where I shouldn't use. Did that tool ever backfire? Yeah. And they go, well, yeah, you know, yeah. I used a gentle assumption with a paranoid patient. That backfired. Then they go, maybe I shouldn't use it with, you know, I mean, there's different ways that you use it. But right. the point is people develop, they look at their own styles and come up with unique techniques. By the way, I ask your viewers, I have a website, uh, uh, suicideassessment.com. I'm sure you'll list that later or whatever. Yes. Um, but um, we're busy rebuilding the whole thing right now. But we've had a thing called the interviewing tip of the month, which people send me tips. Uh, we're going to change that into a more free-flowing thing where people can send many more tips uh, when the website is built. But you'll find if you go to that website, there's like 160 interviewing tips uh, or techniques. From your readers. From, from your from readers. Readers. But also, uh, soon we're going to have this adapted so there's many more free flow. And please send me techniques. Everybody watching this video uh, has things you do that I don't know about that can help clinicians to be better clinicians. So I would love to hear from you. Just send them to that website suicideassessment.com yep right fantastic so in the book too though you know uh, i have in front of me uh, dr shea a list of only some of the techniques it's incredible the range of techniques that you've discussed you know anchor questions stacking questions exaggeration clarifying norms normalization 
introduction to bragging, you know, catch all question, uh, denial yeah. of the specific. I mean, it, 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 you have really uh, brought together a whole body of knowledge and uh, over the years related to interviewing. Yes. Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, the other thing that I, I think is a little bit unique to this book compared to other books on clinical interviewing uh, is that these are not just my techniques. Uh, what I've also tried to do is go out uh, and look at different disciplines, psychology, social work, uh, nursing, counseling. And then also, clearly, I, I really carefully looked at the literature and psychiatry. So throughout the book, you're seeing me talking about things that I didn't develop, things that I've learned from other clinicians, including, for instance, in the chapter on the medication interest model, that we'll be talking about later, I'd say 50% of the techniques described in the book came from readers, uh, or pe I mean, people in my workshops. Uh, so, for instance, um, in the field of psychiatry, uh, Phil Resnick, uh, if you ever get to see Phil Resnick speak, I think he's one of the best, if not the best speaker I, I've seen, a tremendous uh, forensic psychiatrist. And he has multiple innovations uh, with things like validity techniques. I'll give you one example of Phil's that's in the book. Um, uh, if you are working with a patient and you think they are malingering, okay, yeah, uh, how do we... Are there techniques that can help us with the malingering? Well, one of the things that Phil says is that because you and I really understand the psychopathology and how symptoms are experienced by patients, we have a good idea of what the bell curve is. If you hear auditory hallucinations, here's what the auditory hallucinations tend to look like. A malingerer may not know what it really feels or looks like. So one of the things that you can do is you might turn to them and say, um, uh, geez, Jim, when you're hearing these voices, do you ever feel that they just slide under doors and get to you? Well, you know, I've never heard a patient say that. It's right. possible, right. but it's not a typical thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if the patient goes, oh, yeah, man, just like that, slide right under the door. I had a patient or even on a video that answered exactly that way that quick. If you say to the voices, I had a, uh, a one of my uh, readers on um or interviewing tip of the month, they said they're asked the person, do you ever feel like the voice is nibbling at your earlobe? <laughs> you know, I mean, who's that? I mean, and, you know, he says there are malingerers will say, oh, yeah, I've had that experience. Uh, right. And the bottom line is, is that the malingerer might think that because we as psychiatrists are asking about something, we've heard it from patients. Right, right. Uh, now, Phil has a, you operationalize this by simply saying, um, the, the issue is, is that you ask the patient something that is a unlikely symptom from what they're supposedly malingering. Yeah. And the name that he gives to that is the endorsement of bogus symptoms. Right. Endorsement so of bogus new, symptoms. New tool, new interview and technique in the toolkit. With malingering, you can pull out the endorsement of bogus. Uh, a good example, a lot of you might do disability uh, uh, interviews, you know, fairly common disability uh, complaint, uh, things like PTSD, panic disorder. If someone's uh, malingering panic disorder, they're talking about how bad they are and whatever. So in the middle of describing one of the incidents, you might turn to them and say, geez, Ben, you know, when you're having one of these panic attacks, do you find that they, they come on and then, man, this thing is really, really bad. And it lasts hours and hours, whole way through the night. You're still having a panic attack in the morning. Well, if they go, oh, yeah, it's just like that. Well, you and I know that that is not the way panic attacks work. Right. You know, on abruptly and they leave. Uh, there's a fluctuation. So, you know, if that guy endorses that, it's giving you a pretty strong hint this person's probably malignant. Right. There, no, this is a very useful because malingering is a problem that we face in a variety of situations where we suspect malingering. So it's very important for all of us to be ready to use this technique of endorsement of bogus symptoms. Yeah, I mean, as I said, Phil Resnick is just brilliant at coming up with these things. And, and another example of, uh, you know, that I always try to bring in the work of other people in the book, which is what I think is unique uh, about the book to some degree, um, uh, uh, Leston Havens, who unfortunately ha has passed on, but uh, 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 Leston uh, worked out of, I think it was Cambridge uh, in, in Massachusetts, and uh, he had a technique he was particularly good at working with people um, who had paranoid, active paranoid process. And he talked about a technique called counter projection. And what I, I, it's hard to do it justice like this. I can do better justice in the book, but, but counter projection looks like this. 
I'm working with someone that I think is actively paranoid. First time I've met them, I'm just starting to get a hint that there's a paranoid process. Or maybe someone's told me this person's actively paranoid. They've been sent to me uh, in the ED. But bottom line is you really run the risk that at some point in that interview, this guy's going to project out their hostility or whatever onto you, and they're going to, to view you as an antagonist. Okay. And of course, once that happens in an interview, especially in an initial interview, it is really hard to dig out of that because everything you say to prove to the guy, I bet your uh, people viewing this, uh, your clinicians have seen this themselves. Everything you do to dig out of it to explain, no, no, I'm not really saying that way. They just view that as further evidence that you are trying to dig out of it because you really don't like them. So what uh, Haven said uh, was a very effective tool was that uh, he would, before the person projects that out onto us in the initial interview, although he also used it as an ongoing aspect of, of therapy with people with active paranoia. Okay. The way he'd say is, what you want to do is you want to sort of counter the projection before it comes at you by picking something out in the environment that you don't, that you have a problem with, that you think the patient has a problem with, because if you attack that thing, it's very hard for the patient to attack you. In other words, it's that old adage uh, during uh, war makes strange bedfellows. In other words, you know, if aliens attacked us, all of a sudden Russia, China, and the U.S., we'd all be fighting on the same side. Okay? Right, right. Okay. So it's usually a very simple third-person sort of projection. Early in the interview, if you think the person's actively paranoid, you might just say, it's really tough times out there, hard to get by. Okay. I even throw it with my hands uh, away. And what it does is it creates the sensation of the patient says, you're damn right, it's tough times. You know, boom. And what you're doing is you're very gently, you keep throwing things out there that you are saying that are a problem. Yeah. That the patient thinks is a problem. It yeah. makes it very hard for them to attack you. Yeah. Maybe um, politicians. That's a beautiful technique by Leston Havens. Uh, right. Terrific. Terrific. So you, you're, uh, Dr. Shade, Interviewing paranoid patients is is particularly difficult, so I'm glad that you talked about this. And in fact, in the next video, yeah. I think we should we if we, if you don't mind, we would I would like to speak a little for you to speak a little more about how to interview paranoid patients in the next video. Okay, that'd be great. Right. Yep, thanks. See you then. <laughs>